Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for the webinar, What's New with WorkSoft Certify? I'm Mark Beebe, Marketing Campaign Manager for WorkSoft and your host for today's session. First, a couple of logistical points. We do have a large number of people on the call today, so the lines will be muted, but we will take your questions toward the end of the 60-minute broadcast. Please use the question feature to submit questions at any time during the webinar. For questions that we can't get to during the Q&A session, we'll be sure to get back to you with an email reply. We will also make a link to the recording of this webinar available for registrants who are unable to make it or perhaps for colleagues you think might benefit from the material. Uh, before I introduce our speakers today, uh, I want to start out with a couple of polls to kind of gauge where everybody's at and uh, just get warmed up. So our first question today is how long have you been using WorkSoft Certify? We'll give everybody just a moment to vote. And so it looks like uh, the largest category is people that have two plus years experience. Move on to the next poll. Which version of Certify do you currently use? Okay, it looks like the majority uh, of participants today are going to be on uh, version 9. Wow, but a third of the people on 10X. That's great. So this is awesome news because the people on 10, you've got a really short upgrade to this next set of features. So this is pretty exciting. And the people on 9, you're going to want to be on 10 pretty soon. And our final question before we get started, which topic are you most excited hearing about today? Okay, we'll give everybody just a moment to vote. We've got uh, the options, the new Certify UI, process compare and merge, new collaboration features, Oracle testing, and tethered mobile testing. Okay, we'll go ahead and close that poll. It looks like the majority of you are most excited to hear more about the new UI. And that's great. So let me now go ahead and introduce our speakers. We're privileged to have Chris Krauss and Aaron Kriegshauser with us today. Chris is WorkSoft's Director of Product Management for Certify and an expert in the field of test automation. Chris holds patents in service virtualization and testing technologies. During Chris's world travels, he has managed to combine his passions for photography and yoga practice. Over the past 25 years, he has served in a wide variety of engineering and product management roles including most recently for CA Technologies. Today, Chris is responsible for the strategic direction of WorkSoft's flagship products, WorkSoft Certify, and WorkSoft Analyze. Aaron is a professional problem solver and a software programmer, in that order. Aaron has over 20 years of experience building software to solve problems that make people's lives easier. He has been working on WorkSoft Certify since 2014 and is currently the software development manager responsible for the product and its various automation interfaces. In his spare time, he teaches software programming at Collin County Community College, dabbles in acrylic painting, and rides dirt bikes. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Chris. Hello, thank you everyone. So really excited about talking about the beta program. So if you actually roll back 12 months, we're talking about the actual release of Certify 10. So the fact that we've got 30% of the customer base on Certify 10 is amazing. And if you're on you know, 9.2, 9.3, I think these new features are going to be things that you're really going to push for your upgrade to happen. So for our agenda, first I'm going to talk about is the new colors of Visual 40. And it sounds like from the poll, um, doing that first is the number one thing people want to talk about, the new UI and what we're doing. And then we'll talk about change management. So how are we going to make it easier to move your projects and your processes as you start expanding more and more tests. And then we'll look at the new Oracle Business Suite support and then tethered mobile. So modern application. So we really want to make sure people think about WorkSoft and our modern application um, modern application um, platform. It looks like we had a bit of a delay in the WebEx there. And so we think about our platform supporting automated discovery, the ability to globally deploy, have lots of teams working together and collaborating on their tests making sure that the new things we do in Execution Manager, supporting DevOps, and more laptop testing were very massively scalable, and then opening it up, like things we did with the new um, ability to run SOAP UI and actually interoperate with open source technologies. 
And then what we're looking at is how can we apply machine learning to the things we're discovering as analyze? How can we look at your business processes and help you not only process mine to create automation, but to actually figure out common patterns and things? And then, of course, we need to make sure we globally support our customers. Um, we have 24 hour by seven support, and we're finding more and more customers are adopting multi-national um, um, deployment, finding that 24 hour support is really helpful. Okay. So the platform itself, so just to um, give a little refresher to people, um, the way our platform works is you've got the execution engine in the middle, the EE, around it, those are the things about say our web testing and our SAP testing, but then the new things we've done around Web 2.0, mobile, um, the Oracle Business Suite, Java and .NET. So those interfaces are where we keep expanding. And what you'll notice is time has evolved, applications evolve the way they're being rendered, and so we keep extending that, extending that platform to support more and more of those. And with Certify 10, um, what happened is we actually have very nice formalized API layer and services layer that all the other products in the ecosystem sit on across. So that green layer is how all of our other products work together with the core Certify itself. Whether it's using Execution Manager for lights out testing, you're looking at discovering your processes with Analyze and creating automations on top of those. And the nice thing is, um, given that extensibility, we've got a lot of partners building digital transformation, new pre-built content on SAP and you know, Fiori type apps. We've um, opened up to make it easier to interoperate with things like SOAP UI, Jenkins, Visual Team Studio. And then of course, we're keeping up our classic integration. So in this webinar, we'll talk about what's new actually in the Certify Automators Mode client, what we've got new in the interfaces layer, and so in the purple ring and the blue ring, and then what we've done with um, our mobile apps in the gray ring itself. So shaping the future of WorkSoft. So where did these ideas come from and how am I actually prioritizing this as a product manager? So there's three things I look at. Um, input from my customers, so your input itself. So we had a lot of these requests come off the customer advisory board, also our um, ideation forms. So the trick is when people put things in the ideation form and you vote on them, and you comment on them, that helps me prioritize what will help my larger customer base. So I encourage you to keep going to the ideation forums. I tend to look through there every other week and I'll status those. You can see if we're reviewing them, they're in development and when they'll be released. So obviously when this next version of Certified comes to GA, the things that are under development will be flipped to release. Okay. And then in the spirit of Agile, we follow a kind of a standard scrum process here. Easy to use, easy to scan, scale, easy to maintain. Those are my core themes that I'm aligning all these stories against. And of course, monitoring new technologies, making sure we're open and innovative, working with the news like Solman 7.2, Jenkins, WI, and so forth. So if we look back at 2017, what happens? Well, at the beginning of the year, we had Certified 10, which was the new execution engine, the automator's mode. So all those great new um, interfaces are available, the new client server, this client server technology is replaced with the um, in-tier technology, making it easier to deploy remote connections to certify. And 1001 came out this summer, and that's where we really focused on ideation form. What were customers asking for in the, in the ideation form that were very visible? So graphical process compare, find and replace, exploratory testing, results history, um, com um, compare, and the diagnostics tools. Um, in Analyze, we added new themes for process mining and capture enhancement. Management in Studio, we're making sure we're getting more and more of the administration of the products in there, so you have a nice, simple user interface with positive feedback. You get database administration there, user administration and configuration of the operation suite, and we'll keep expanding that into more parts of the product, and then Execution Manager itself. The new version we've got deployed in the field and it's getting great results. The enhanced scalability, the remote desktop support, and actually running faster. And a lot of people are looking at how do I run my tests from Jenkins. So all of good steps in the right direction. So if you um, missed the last webinar on what was new on Certified 10 and 10.01, um, here's a short summary of that. And notice the resources on the right. There are YouTube videos out there in the workshop channel that discuss our ability to run SOPY tests so that you can re-leverage assets um, in your end-to-end -end processes. You can run your certified processes from your continuous integration platforms with the new execution manager. 
Um, in Certified 1001 with exploratory testing, the great thing is if someone can walk through their exploratory test or their capture technology, it imports in, it gives you the, the nice VPP reports, you see what they did, along with jumpstarting your automation. Uh, process compare to make it easier to understand how to do consolidation, and then find and replace. So when you're spanning multiple systems and your data for your record sets don't line out, how do you take those variables across multiple processes very easily? And then, of course, the history compare, uh, which was really focused on um, people who are running like Solution Manager and want an easy way from one window to see the history of a test run, has it been historically passing or failing? Because what we find is with people moving towards DevOps and these more um, continuous testing techniques, they're running tests more often, so they need to very quickly see the differences. And is this a noisy test or is this a new failure on a test? Okay? And then in 1002, we technically had the new enhanced ribbon bar and color. So we introduced this at the customer conference last month. And then in 1003, we're adding the process export and import in our merge technology, our tethering mobile, and our Oracle business suite. So um, internally, these were our, our 1002 and 1003 were separate code branches, and we're trying to decide the best thing to do. We could just release the one and then come back a month and a half later with the next, or we kind of held back on the colors, and we want to bring them all together in one beta. So you have the chance to try all the features. Um, and then we may go on and release them separately, but we think we'll go on and combine them. We figure it's a good time with the beta to let everybody see as many features as possible, and then the releases will follow. So certified 1003. So this is what we're going to have in the beta for you to use. So what have we done? So really focus on visual affordance. So in the certified 9.3 UI, the buttons were kind of muted. We didn't have labels on them. So we went through and said, how do we make sure it's easier to interact with the user interface from a visual ports perspective? Making sure the buttons are easy to read, understand. If they're disabled or enabled, it should be easy to understand. I've actually modified the table controls to make sure the filters and sorting is easier to work with. And then worked with the process train, did some refinement on the icons and the leading lines, making sure it's easier to visually navigate and understand where you are. And then looked at the um, actual tree controls elsewhere. Notice we're using very literal icons, check something passed, exit failed, blue folders. So make sure it's easier to understand and give you statuses in the tree controls along the way. The other thing is we actually looked at the navigation. So there's a lot of different areas you can navigate into in the product. But in reality, you tend to use certain things requirements, processes, data, and results. That's what people tend to bounce between most often. Now, you know, adding variables and users and groups and applications don't happen as often. And so I wanted to make sure to highlight the things that are most often used and group the other things. If we made everything a separate color, then there would just be too much color. We would not have good positive visual affordance. So the idea is the four things that we want that you're in the most, we've highlighted the most. And then the window identification. So the color in the navigation, like the green for your results, or the orange for data, and the requirements, um, all those things are actually highlighted in the same colors. So I'm going to actually go to the product and let's look at the new colors in the UI specifically. So what I can see here is certified. Now I'll notice my folder and my new are highlighted. My buttons. They're all gray, right? So it's very easy to see they're enabled or disabled. Okay? And then within the processes themselves, I'm carrying a blue title bar on the processes and then the blue navigation on the left. So what this does is gives me instant visual feedback of what's there. And as I select, you'll notice that we're doing um, a good job of moving the highlights and the visual cord is there. We've done things to make sure it's easier when you're highlighting rows, that they um, get navigation easier. Um, the other things I've done is I'm looking at the actual, what do people interact with the most? So like column, um, the ability to filter column. So before the filter was there, but it wasn't very easy to distinguish. So putting a high contrast color on the dark gray makes it easier to find these things. And then make it, we actually increase the size of the divider bar to make them easier to grab. So we want to make it easier to grab dividers and tables, and then also 
here in the middle. We actually expanded this divider bar to make it easier to see there. So these are things we want to make sure that when you're just navigating, things have become easier to do. So if I actually open, say, a process, um, you'll notice the title bar's here. As I select the blue banner on the top, it makes it very easy to distinguish which one is active. If I double click a process, you'll notice what we'll do is we'll maintain the blue and the title bar here for the processes. So from a visual perspective, if you're skipping between multiple windows, open and certify, it's easy to tell the differences, okay? Um, positive identification and icons and how they work. Um, the other things we've done is we've made sure that it's easy to understand when you've actually selected and you're working with an icon here. The tooltips pop out in white. So done a lot of work to make sure that the icons are visible, understanding what's available from actions, and then the navigation of the columns themselves. So if I go over to the results, what you'll notice is I'll flip the results bars to be green, so it's easy to distinguish there. If I go through and I open a process, same thing here. When I open my processes, I'll get my green bars, so if I have multiple processes open, I Alt-Tab between my windows, and then as I highlight a tab, you'll see the green bar goes across the top, and the processes, they were blue, and the results, they're green, and I can actually see the results here. We simplified the checkboxes and the X's and the navigation tree so they're more consistent and visually available. Okay? So everything we've done here, we're keeping the core navigation the same. We're just working on making sure that navigation is easier to get to. Okay? And then also with the data. So when we look at data, we can actually see what's happening here. So I can see my folder tabs still highlight in the correct colors. It's easier to navigate between things. So everything we've done inside of um, the um, UI itself is looking at and figuring out how do we make it easier to navigate and understand where I am and move between the processes. So my screen is reflecting slowly. There we go. So we've got a poll question coming up. Um, on the um, which do you prefer? So when we redid the button bars, we went to a green play button. And so we had some feedback internally. People were like, hmm, I kind of miss the running man. So we'll have Mark open up a poll and tell us what, what are you most interested in? So we took this poll internally, and so we'll see if it's just works off people, um, or do the customers very passionate about it? Wow. Okay, Running Man. Okay, interesting. Save Running Man. Save Running Man. I think I hear a new campaign. Yeah. We should save the Running Man. So 56% of people are interested in keeping the Running Man. It's interesting to talk about that. And then you've got the play symbol, 34%, and then picture, come on, 10%, really? Little, we can get a little um, digitized emoji of me, maybe for specific people. Okay. So we were looking at um, the cool thing about doing Agile and doing a beta. It's a beta isn't just have customers say, yeah, it exists. What we want to do is get positive feedback from the user interface. So as you're in the beta program, if there's things you say, this icon doesn't make sense, you know, would a color shift and something make it easier based on monitors you're seeing? We're in the right position to actually make those changes itself. So in this case, we'll be able to actually go swap the icon from the play back to a running man emoji. So uh, good stuff there. So the idea of the beta is not just to say we have one, but we want you to participate, enjoy it, and give us feedback. So this feedback, I'll go back to my developer and say, let's go, let's go change the icon. The next thing I want to talk about is um, the change management. Okay, so last year I did a focus group with nine customers. And quite honestly, the focus group started before I had my advisory board set up and before with the ideation form. So basically, it was people who I spoke to um, at our user conference and people I talked to um, about uh, roadmap things. And so I started my relationship with customer base with a sampling of nine people. 
And what I did is I said, I hear people saying that we need versioning. Developers tell me I need versioning. And when we started looking at this, what they need versioning or what they really need is change management. I need a much easier way to move certified processes between projects, move certified processes between databases. So the idea is I need to make it much easier to manage large-scale deployments and actually look at splitting databases. So um, I came up with my three core personas. We've got Andy the automator. Andy's the guy who loves to work with Certify every day. He automates processes. He may get um, the ability to run his processes and do BPP reports. We've got Betty the business analyst. And Betty doesn't really work on Certify, but she will consume the BPP reports and she would use maybe our analyzed technology to discover business processes and generate documentation on them. And then that handshakes the automation to Andy. And then the last one is Carol, the certified administrator. So most everybody has a standard certified administrator who's interested in making sure that their processes are clean, they run in production, and they need to make sure the results are maintained for um, different reports. So Carol probably uh, overlaps Andy that she does some automation, but she's the person who moves things between um, environments. Okay? So we fleshed out, we fleshed out three core themes. We looked at import and export of assets between projects, um, and then people want to see the differences between processes when they move them. Um, and so those are the things we started working on first. There's actually 11 core stories generated, and then from there, all of our acceptance criteria came down. Uh, we, when the ideation form came on board, we put in the ideation form. We had um, lots of votes, 28 votes there. And then two comments, and from then now, that's actually expanded to a lot more. So um, the stories. Once upon a time, uh, Carol had one or more processes she needed to export into an existing um, production project with dependencies. So that's one thing people say, I've got to update an existing process, so I pull it over into Sandbox in a project, I need to move it back to another database or another project. Or, Carol has a folder of uh, processes that she needs to export to a new project to seed assets for contractors to do their work. Um, we've found a lot of people like this concept that can I take an existing working set of processes, extract them, move them into a new project or a new sandbox for maybe a contractor to work with or maybe a new certify Andy automator to work with. And so, you know, it's a backup copy for him to play with, right? And then the other thing is Carol says, as an administrator, she works with a lot of system integrators, and they've got some pre-built content to help accelerate their offering of processes and getting their end-to-end -end processes validated. So she needed an easy way to import those based on industry solutions. Um, as you can imagine, if one of our partners builds um, their certified processes in the database, they need to get them extracted out into a file that then can be brought into their environment because they wouldn't have naturally have access to two databases. So if we take these three core stories, um, what we came up with for our MVP, Minimal Viable Project, is first thing we need to do was export processes. So from Certify, you export a process or a folder of processes, okay? Now, the interesting thing is we actually understand all the dependencies when we gather them. So if the process has a sub-process, if it has record sets or record filters, has its layouts and variables, all those things are gathered. Also, the data type map. If that process is tied to a requirement, the application version, the map objects, the attributes, and the execution flow rules. Literally, everything that is involved around a process to support it and so it can run and can be edited is actually gathered and put into a zip file. So what we do is we pull it and we put it outside of the database. So what this is, is it gave us a way to actually move this between environments easy. Maybe a partner gives it to you, or you want to give it to someone else who has a personal certified database, uh, or maybe between different projects. So we wanted to get the assets referenced, the full hierarchy of dependencies, and then zipped out. The next thing we did is we actually went through how do we import the file. So with the concept of import is we could take that and go into maybe a new database or a new project, and we'll then do a right click and we'll import. Now, what we do is we keep the relative structure of all the folders. So you'll see um, I have an import and then I have SAP dev, order to cache. So what I've done 
is my import process created the import folder and then everything underneath it follows the same hierarchy. So the good thing is if you're used to your variables being in certain spots and then your record last in a certain spot and you've done some organization of your reusable processes, we understand that and we maintain that structure. So we don't want to flatten it out because you can run into naming conventions. So we import, we actually keep the relative path. But what we did is we import into a new folder so you can look at it first and then do your merging process. But now, quite honestly, if this is something where you're um, seeding a new project, it's great. You're locked and loaded, everything you need is there. Okay, so you'll notice with the layouts and the data, we've kept the same structure so that when you go into that area, and then you look at the variables, you go into that area, you'll see them there. So we did, we were very, um, specific and that when we exported and imported, we wanted to keep all the paths to everything in the same relative position. Okay. Now, of course, if there's a process and a sub-process, we've, we've made sure that those parent IDs all work correctly for you. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go over to Certify. I'm going to show you how the import and export process works, and then we'll look at the merging concept. So how would I actually merge, say, from one folder to another folder once I've imported, and then what happens when you have collisions and different changes? So I'll open up Certify. So I'm actually in my test area. So I'm gonna go to my processes. And if I look at my sandbox, that's me. I've got some um, processes in my weekly run folder. I've got processes in my Jenkins run, and I've got processes in my daily, okay? So the idea is I'm kind of happy with this work in my sandbox. Now, I'm, what I want to do is I want to export this. I want to go move it over into a new project, okay? So at the folder level or at a process level. So if I look at a process level and I do a right click, I can say um, export. So what I can do is actually export the process out, or I can go to my daily run folder, and in that case, I can export there. So I have support for both. In this case, I'm gonna take my whole folder. So I'm gonna say export folder processes, and I'm gonna get the ability to name it. Now, I'm in debug mode, because this is early beta, so I'll get an extra prompt in a window. And this is kind of cool because I can show you what's in that zip file. So it's done. And then what happens is I created a zip file called daily run. And then right now, because I'm in a special debug version, I actually have a folder exploded. And what I can see here is this JSON files here, these are all the files and dependencies we gathered. And this manifest here is actually all the information we grabbed. We know the date, the import, and the ex or the export in this case, the server, the process counts, and all the information about it. So we actually are keeping what's called a manifest, so we know it's in the zip file and the dependencies of them. Okay? So as, um, as I go through and I export these three, I'll grab the daily run, and then I'm gonna grab the Jenkins run. I'm gonna go and export that process. my little debug message, and I can see there it worked. And also, I'll go grab my weeklies. So, as you can imagine, I'm doing three separate exports, comes on imports them three different ways to kind of show you the use cases we have covered. Awesome, so I've got my daily, my Jenkins, and my weekly zip file, okay? So now, the nice thing is I can actually take this to another machine, take this to a different environment, um, or I can leave it locally and just change what I'm pointing to. So I'm just gonna use the shortcut of command O. I'm gonna go open my project, which is my master project. And this is technically my production area. So what I can see here is I have my daily run. So I have some processes there. I have Jenkins, so I've got four processes there. And on my weekly run, I can see there's nothing there. So this is my production folder. This is where I actually run all my um, tests. So this database, I want to be pretty clean. I'm not editing in it, but it's got heavy results, lots and lots of results there. So 
first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go import the weekly run and see what it looks like when I seed a folder with it says processes that have, um, that is completely empty, right? So this could be I'm giving this to someone to work on in their sandbox. Maybe I'm giving it to a partner so then we go work on, or maybe a partner is delivering something to me. So use case one, let's import the weekly and see what it looks like to merge it into the weekly run folder that's empty. When I click master at the highest level, I can see um, import processes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the weekly run and click OK. So during the import process, um, my buddy Aaron did a great job. He goes through and he creates a nice unique folder for me, and I can see all the information about it. So in my process folder, I have import, and if I start walking down, I can see this is the sandbox, there's my cell, there's my weekly run. So there's all the relative information um, for these processes, right? So from a um, perspective, um, what I want to do is I want to take these and I want to move them over into my production folder, okay? This weekly run folder here. So if I do a right, um, right click, I'm saying merge into other folder. So merge is a new thing. It's different than our cut and our paste and our copy. What we're doing with merging is we're, we're very conscious. We want to look at dependencies. We want to move processes over. In this case, since there's no processes, it would be the equivalent kind of of a copy. Um, so if I say merge into another folder, I have to go pick my folder. I'm going to say merge these into my weekly. So I hide it, highlight it, and click select. Oops, we had that. So what's happened now is I've taken these processes and they're being moved over. I'm getting to slow down the internet. I'm getting a warning in Event Center. So while Chris is uh, you know, checking out his internet connection, I'm going to talk about uh, what's actually happening there. So at this point, he was merging uh, from the import folder into his production folder. And uh, it was checking to see if there was any processes with, that had the same name or folders with the same name, so on and so forth. Because it was empty, it went ahead and, go ahead and did the merge itself. Uh, if there was a conflict, meaning there was a process with the same name in there, then it would ask you, the user, to make a decision upon that, um, that conflict and whether you want to overwrite what's in the production folder or if you wanted to um, uh, perform a, an individual merge by looking at the two processes and deciding what, what that needs to be merged and what that needs to be left alone. Yep. So I think the Internet's refreshing. Uh, I hate Wi-Fi. So what I've got now is I've got my, um, my processes, and they're moving back and forth. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go look at my folders and figure out what should I do in terms of moving my sandbox. Um, so if I've got my um, Jenkins folder, um, it's empty. Um, my first weekly folder was empty. Now I've got my Jenkins run. Now what happens here is I've got this import, which I'm going to close up, and I've got my Jenkins run. So this actually has existing processes in this folder. So in this case, what I'm going to have to do is like maybe copy some new things um, or um, insert some new ones. So I'm actually have a, there could be some conflicts here. So the weekly one was let's do it from an empty one. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a right click on the master. I'm going to do import. Now with this import process, I'm going to pick the Jenkins zip. So what this one does is it's got um, it, it'll give me a different uh, use case or opportunity to look at. So I've imported. So in this import, I can see my um, sandbox for Chris. And I've got my Jenkins run. So in this case, right, I've got four processes here. And over on my production side, I've got four processes. So in this case, it's a different use case. I'm not deploying this into an empty folder. There's processes there. So I need to worry about how do I overlay them and so forth. So in this one, if I grab the Jenkins, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this Jenkins folder to my production Jenkins folder. So I'll do a right click, merge into another folder. So I go to import. Jenkins. 
So in this case, this folder has processes in it, so it's gonna look a little bit different. So during process comparison, and what I can see here is there's some conflict. Um, what it tells me is I have compared two folders, and there's four processes in each folder. Now, the process names matched, okay? So that means that what I had from, I imported versus my production folder, I have the same processes, they match by name. But what's interesting is, one of these actually has a change to it. So this, the simple sales order is different. So the, I made a change in my development environment in simple sales order. I didn't change my create billing and my post goods. We identified that. So what can I do? Well, by default, um, maybe I'm just going to replace. So I'm going to select replace target. So that means I'm going to take my new version. I'm going to copy it over. Okay. So when I click save, it says, are you sure? And it's going to do it. So the nice thing now is I'm replacing my existing Jenkins run with the old one. So what does this mean to you? Well, if this simple order was used by another process, maybe it's called as a sub-process, when you copy and you paste, you have different IDs. And you may miss, you may, the parents, um, if this is a child, the parents may get misaligned. In this case, what we do is we actually replace this sales order with a new one. So anytime you're referencing this, this process by name and by ID, it's actually the same ID. So we think this is probably one of the most popular, I'm gonna say this is the 80th percentile use case. I have um, processes that I'm gonna do in my sandbox. I edited one of those processes. I brought them over to production and then I'm going to import them, okay? In this case, we saw there was a conflict and I said, yep, I, I changed that one program so I want to replace it with my new version. Now, the good thing is, when we do these imports, if there's any new variables, there's new layouts, new record sets, new data, those actually get pulled with us. So all those things are getting copied over, okay? Now, I'll show you one last use case. This is my daily run. So with daily run here, I've got five processes. I'm gonna go in and import this, and what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna look at the emerge screen so I can see what's changed so that the concept of compare processes and merge processes. What I can visualize what's actually changed. So if I import here, I'm gonna take my daily run and say open. So here I have my daily run. Now, you notice I've got a handful of um, folders here. So I could do something simple like let's go edit this and in case you know, you're working on this over time, you can actually rename this to make it easier to remember where you are, right? So okay, there's my daily work I just imported, the sandbox, Chris is doing his work, it's got his daily run. Now in this case, I've got five processes and I actually have a, a, um, a parent process and sub processes, okay? Um, this also has um, some differences. So if I look here at my steps, um, I call these children processes, if I look at the BA1, the simple sales order, I can see this is variableized, okay? Now what I'm gonna notice is in my production area that in my daily run, if I look at these processes here, and I look at my simple sales order, these are hard-coded. So, so I would expect there to be a conflict that these are different, so I'm gonna show you how we visualize that and how you can see the differences in them, okay? So I'm gonna come back over and I, I tend, I like easy units of work. So I'm gonna say, I want to um, do a sales order and I wanna move that over to my daily run, okay? So I'm gonna say, merge into other process. Now I'm gonna go navigate over to my folder. So there's my daily run and there's my sales order process. So what we'll see here is actually the comparison and merging screen. So this is new. And certified 1001, we created the process compare, which lets you see a process, see the step processes and the differences. The annotation on this is green check boxes are they're the same. Um, so I can see here my process properties, these are the same. So I'm just gonna class this with the minus sign. I'm gonna work from top to bottom. Solution manager stuff's the same. Okay. Now I can see the source, the arrow goes in, so I can see these are coming from the left side. Now, these over here, I don't have any checkboxes here, so none of these are being merged. 
But the idea is I can look at what the difference is, okay? So it looks like by coming to my processes, I start seeing some differences. So if I look at input, this is import order type, it's a variable, and this one is hard coded. So I can see the differences as I navigate between here. Um, I can skip down and see the last difference. I can see the next difference. So I can actually skip through and say, okay, what's the next change? Easy to navigate. Go to the last difference. And I can navigate through the trees themselves, okay? So I can see here, they put zero, zero. This is the division. So the idea is if I'm gonna do a merge, if I wanted to, I could maybe keep something from this left side and merge it in. So in this case, I said, actually, I want to keep this row here. So the arrow showed this data came from the, from the target. This came from the source. But the idea is we want to make it easy to visualize the differences. So checks are the same. A um, plus is a new field. A minus is a missing field. Um, and then pencils is there's changes in data itself. So these are the same things that we put into the process compare. We're just leveraging that same technology here. And in reality, um, I may go on, based on customer feedback, just remove the whole process compare and make this UI the same UI for both and skip the middle area on compare, give you an option to compare. But the idea is I can skip through my processes, quickly see what are the differences. Okay? So these all look pretty good and similar. Um, so if I actually pick something here, and I will say, well, are there any more differences? I'm just going to say, skip to the last next difference. Yep. There's no next difference, so I must read the difference. So the rest of my sub-processes are the same. So now, when I actually look at doing my, um, my merging of these processes, I know what actual change is being moved in. Because our use case was Carol, the certified administrator, was very interested and not just blanket moving processes and sometimes, sometimes you want to eyeball them to understand what the differences were. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. They variableized hard-coded data, so that's a good thing. So we wouldn't have gone on and moved this. Um, maybe if Carol doesn't like what they changed, you know, she could reject it and she can say cancel or she can merge it. But it gives her some control. Uh, she can say blanket move or with the new process merge and the difference here, you can actually look at the differences there. So the idea is, um, she can actually get her job done easily. So at this point, we're going to go over to the new stuff in Oracle Forms. So this is a new interface. So the new Oracle Forms interface, we have really fast live touch, it's fast playback, and we have new automatic object uh, recognition. So the idea is the same type of experience you have with SAP GUI, we're providing that in Oracle Forms. Because we found some existing customers are very interested in this data. So at this point, I'm going to pass over to Aaron, and he's going to do a demo for us. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I'm going to show my screen. Great. Right. Thank you. I'm going to go back over to my virtual machine. And so in Certify, I wanted to show you where this new Oracle uh, Forms interface is. Within my application section, I have an existing application I call EBS. And I have an existing uh, application version I call QA. But if I wanted to add, let's say, a pre-prod application version, I would right-click and do new version. And you can see in the list of interfaces, we now have Oracle Forms. Brand new uh, certified interface specific to uh, Oracle uh, Oracle's Oracle Form technology. OK. Great. All right, so I'm going to go show. Um, Live touching a, an Oracle form. Let me go create a new process and insert steps using low losing live touch. And we'll wait for live touch to come up. All right, we'll pause it. And you can see within the enable menu, we have Oracle forms here. All right, I'm going to open up uh, purchase orders module and Let's start up live touch. As you can see, as we go and highlight over, you can see that you know, we have a, the supplier text box. Uh, we can see that the class is the Oracle edit, and you can see the nice pretty name with it. As I hover over shift two, buyer, description, so on and so forth. One of the challenges we had 
with automating Oracle Forms in the past with our Java interface was tables. Tables um, don't really exist uh, within the Oracle Forms uh, space um, as a table construct, and so therefore we had to look at how fields are laid out on the screen using a layout algorithm, interpretation algorithm to come up with what we call the table facade. And it worked, and then it did work. Um, well, with this new technology and new approach, then it's easy for us to go in and identify it as a table. And right away, it makes it so much faster. All right, and if I pause, we can open up another form, start, and as you can see, even more user controls, and it's very fast from identification purposes. Okay, great, so that's identifying items within uh, Live Touch. Okay. Let me go ahead and close this out and open up an existing process, and let's look at um, execution playback. Here I have a series of test steps, and just going to automate the same screen, make sure that the application is in the correct state, and I'll go ahead and hit playback. As you can see, there's no step delay. I'll hit start. And I'll hit run. So with the new interface, it really reduces the technical bar for testing this, right? Because it certainly does. All the actions we're used to with tables and drop downs and radio buttons all just work, right? They certainly do. So there's no, no editing required. Yeah, uh, with the existing job interface, it was up the burden was put on the automator to go and uh, manipulate the um, object attribute strings mm -hmm. almost in every single object that was identified. Here, you would just go ahead and record and build your automation and play it back. And as you can see, um, it's uh, about you know less than two seconds each step. Um, sometimes it's sub-second going through, which is fantastic for us. Uh, with the old Java interface, it could have taken up to sometimes a minute per step, depending upon what it's trying to do. So drastic improvement. We're yeah. totally excited about this new technology. Yeah, so when I saw this running the other day with the developer, he ran 400 test steps in less than a minute. Yes. So really happy with the performance here. And the fact that now I can use it, because I just have to live touch, and right. all the objects are positively identified, no editing, and I can use my standard table actions, and that just, it's awesome. Yeah, it's worked the way it should. We're so confident about this Oracle interface, Chris, that we did not even build a learn tool. Wow. Okay, all you need is live touch. It's so fast. Yes, and easy. Cool. cool. So we'll come back to the presentation. So we just saw the Oracle Forms demo. And because we knew I was going to be blah, 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 talking so much about the new colors and gushing about that and the new process compare, uh, we knew we wouldn't have time to do the tether level demo. But I've got, I'll tell you about it. And the problem is, how would you know if I'm, my mobile device is tethered or not? Because we're in a WebEx, right? So what we've done is we now have a great um, experience with Xperia test and a digital assurance lab. So you can now have on-premise USB attached devices, and this could be Android or Apple devices attached to your PC. Um, you can share those across multiple tests, and then you can also go to cloud hosted for SAS when needed. We support capture and live touch for this. So if you're at the user conference, you would have seen Aaron, that guy in the suit, the, the fancy one, showing this on the screen. And so since it was live, he could hold up his phone and say, see, it's working, but you can see that we um, see the image of the application locally as a certified process runs and goes through the banking application, all the normal click actions work. So the good thing about the way certify works is the object action framework is the same. A button click is a button click. It's Aaron's job and the developer's job and the interface to say, is this a button click on a mobile device, on an Oracle form, on SAP GUI, web, java.net, right? So it really lowers the bar for authoring tests the way we do it because we handle the, the complications beneath the scenes. So really thrilled about this. We've actually got some early adopters of this technology ready, and we're finding that customers are very interested in locally attached devices, so this gives them that ability. So um, how do we go from here? So we've kind of given you a map of what's coming up. 
Um, now the point is, how do you start your journey in the beta program? So the beta topology, this is what we did last time with, with some great success. What we've done is we've hosted the analyzed services layer and the database in the cloud. And then what will happen is customers will be able to connect to that and then certify locally. So the reason we've done this is um, we know it's hard for you to maybe work with IT to get a new database, a new machine, and all that. So the idea is let's bring up a certified client in your environment, and then all the other infrastructure will handle. Okay? So we'll let you connect to that instance. So what you'll do is you will send an um, email, or you'll go into our support system and make a support case and say who wants to join the beta program. Okay? Um, we will then give you the download link to the customer site to download the certified client. We'll support HTTP and HTTPS connections. And what happens is, by default, we'll give you um, a couple logins to the server environment and your own tenancy. So the idea is you can um, work um, in your own tests, play with these things, try things out there, um, and it'll be your private instance there. Um, so when we look at the, what we're doing, is this is definitely an automator's mode. So this is using the new um, IIS. So we have the services layer, so it's automator's mode. Um, the database and the service are we hosted. We put that in Amazon, it's a good place. Um, people often ask, do we run in a hosted environment? Of course we do. Um, you, we, you can give us a project, and then we can actually um, work with you to get that in there. Now, we will give you login and credentials there. So when you enter your support request, we'll reply back, give you a couple logins, your tenancy, and that'll be set up for you. We will have master content preloaded, um, which we can work on getting other stuff there, right? Um, and then the Certify M10 client will be available for download to the community to connect there. So the way you're going to get engaged is start your support request. Over the next couple weeks, we'll get those in. We'll start provisioning you, and we'll put the download there, and you can start. So at this point, um, we've just got a handful of questions left, um, or time left for questions. So I'll pass it over to Mark. All right, thank you, Chris and Aaron. And now we come to the part where we take your questions. Uh, we've just got a few minutes left, um, and we have had quite a few questions come in, so we'll try to, to get to a couple. Um, but we will uh, we'll certainly get back to some of those questions um, with email replies later. Um, so our first question: We're sold. We want in. How do we sign up for the beta? Okay. So definitely go to go to your portal.workstuff.com and open a support request or email support and put in your title bar. I want to join the beta program. And then that will kick it off. Support will start the process of creating the user IDs and getting you the software to download. Okay. Uh, how do I get started using Xperia Test to do tethered mobile? Well, the customers we have starting already are Xperia Test customers. So they are, they're Xperia Test customers and they're attaching the new interface to it. So if, um, this will be this new interface will be available and is beta, and then in the next release, you can get a um, You'll need to get Xperia Test, the software from them. You'll attach your local devices, and then we attach to it through software. Okay, our next question. Uh, when do you expect 10.0.3 to be ready? So we're looking at running the beta through the end of the year, because we found that this time it's slow because a lot of people aren't making production moves, but they saw a lot of stuff going on. So I think it's reasonable that we're going to keep the beta open for at least two months. And then at the beginning of the year, first quarter, we'll push our GA. So this will give you time to um, download the software, play with it, give us feedback. And then we want to be able to do a round of usability. If customers, they don't like the color, the results. The orange and the yellow are too similar, things like that. We want time to make corrective changes and then refresh the beta there. So the beta will be open definitely for two months, and then we'll go GA. OK, the next one, Aaron, here's a question for you. Can we use both the Java and Oracle Forms interfaces at the same time to automate Oracle EBS Forms? Um, <clears throat> so if you're starting up a brand new uh, automation project for Oracle Forms, uh, we suggest you start off with only Oracle Forms interface. However, uh, we have some customers who have been using Certify to automate uh, their EBS uh, Oracle Forms applications already. Um, so the answer is, is that Yes, you can uh, go back and uh, maybe you have a step that's uh, slow with the current Java interface. Learn that new object with the Oracle Forms interface and replace it. And during execution, they'll play back both Java and Oracle Forms uh, steps. 
Okay, our next question. Can we migrate existing manual test scripts from ALM to WorkSoft Certify? How about UFT? Okay, so ALM does have an ability to export your manual tests into a CSV file. So um, you would have to export them, and then we would basically write a certify process to read the CSV file and import them. There's no right-click import, but we could do it um, with a little bit of um, certify, robotic certify itself. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, can you compare objects in the same way as processes? And so this, in this case, we're doing the um, process compare first. Right. And then you're wondering, like, if an application version is different, something like that? Well, probably two different objects itself. Um, yeah, we need to explore that use case in terms of uh, why that would be necessary. Uh, we certainly could build in functionality to do that. Um, I want to understand the user's story mm -hmm. of when they would want to do that and make sure we build the tool in an appropriate way. We do, uh, we'll build tools as part of the change management epic uh, around uh, merging folders of variables mm -hmm. uh, and as well as layouts and record sets. Um, so that's coming as well later on. Okay. Cool. Okay, one final quick question. Uh, for the hosted beta, how many users can we have? So by default, we'll give each customer two users. If you needed more, we can provision more. So the, the, when you enter, send yourself to support, they'll start provisioning and create your tenancy and give you two users by default. Right. Great, thank you, Aaron and Chris, and thank you to everyone for attending. If we weren't able to get to your question, we will be in touch uh, with, with more information. As mentioned earlier, we'll be sending a link to a recording of the webinar, and if you're interested in learning more about WorkSoft, please visit our website. Thank you for your time today. This concludes the webinar. Have a great day.